Do me a favour, if you wouldn't mind. Would you please just close your eyes and pray with me? Lord, I want to thank you for, uh, Lord, this building that we're in. I want to thank you for this community of faith. God, I thank you, Lord, that we are uh, a part of your family. We are not your family. We're not the only ones, God. Father, we pray for every church in our community this morning, Lord, every one that's standing up right now and, and preaching the word of God. Father, we pray for them, Lord. Would you give them the words to speak? Uh, let it be a word in season, a timely word for that particular congregation. And Father, I just pray this morning, Lord, that you, uh, God, I thank you that you've been taking us as a community on a journey uh, this year. And uh, Father, we are, uh, Lord, grateful for that. And Father, I just pray that you would give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us now, God, as we take this next step in this journey of renewing our minds, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 Um, for those of you that have been here, uh, it's funny because we, we, we kind of, um, we, we, we preach series at different times, but every now and then something pops up that we just feel like God is saying and it just kind of never ends. It just kind of drags on, if that makes sense. And uh, what are we now? We're April. And we've really only preached on two things all year. We, the first four weeks we preached on um, uh, the, the change you need to make as opposed to the change you want to make. Because New Year's Eve, everyone's thinking about the changes they want to make. But our challenge was, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What is the change you need to make? Not just the change you want to make, what do you need to make? Because there are things in our life, if we don't get a grip on them and get a hold of them, bring them in submission under Christ, we know that there are some things in our life they could take us out, couldn't they? They could take us out health-wise. They could take us out spiritually. They could destroy our marriage. They could, dis- they, they could destroy our employment. They could do all kinds of things. So the first four weeks, we really wrestled with that, and we got some things put in a... We all wrote things on paper and put them down and so on, and uh, we sort of talked through the different issues around that. And then at the end of those four weeks, we moved on to this series on renewing your mind. So we've been going now basically February, March, April for about three months uh, in and off talking about renewing our minds. So... What we're going to do today is we're going to continue this journey of renewing our mind. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. But I'm going to preface by saying we're beginning to move into the unsexy parts of it. Okay? I, I, if, I, if we were a mega church with $100 billion trillion, I would have put vegetables all around the room today just to preface and let you know that we're about to have vegetables now. Uh, when we talked about renewing our mind and we talked about limiting thoughts and ways that we saw ourselves and uh, things that were holding us back from being all God wants us to be and doing your things, and, you know, that's, that's great. I love that stuff because I feel like there's freedom coming to me and I'm, I'm seeing myself how God wants me to see myself and I'm seeing him for who he is and the church for who it is and there's this sense of excitement about that. But now what I want to do is move from an internal look at what it means to renew the mind to start to look externally. What does it mean to be people that live with a renewed mind? Particularly in culture that exists in the Western world and unfortunately is also creeping into the Western church in 2024. So we're going to talk a bit about a few cultural issues over the coming weeks, some things that uh, I, I think maybe, maybe we've been too silent on for too long and maybe we should have talked about some of these things earlier. I don't know. But I just know that right now I feel the Holy Spirit is saying this is the time for us to have a look at some of these different issues. Um, So Romans 12, verse 1 to 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, God has been so good to you. Amen? Because he's been so good to you. Paul says, because God has been so good to you, would you give yourself to him? Would you give yourself to God? Would you offer your life up to him because he's been so good? Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And then he says this. How do we do that? How do we, how do we offer ourselves up to God? What's, what does it mean practically? And then he goes on. He says, now here's how you do that. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, whatever happens up here, whatever's going on up here generally comes out here. Right? Our thought life, one of the greatest battles for for, for believers and even for non-believers is up here. Our our mind is literally a battleground. And there's, there's, there's so much stuff racing through here, so much information, so many things trying to pull us in different directions so that we will believe and think a certain way. Because if we believe and think a certain way, we will then go on and act a certain way, won't we? Our actions will follow our thoughts and follow our beliefs. And he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, only then... Will you be able to test and approve what God's will is? His good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, he's saying if you're going to be conformed to the pattern of this world, you're never actually going to know the will of God. But if you commit yourself to being transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
then you'll be the kind of person that begins to see and understand and discern the will of God. And I don't think there's probably been a time in my lifetime anyway where the church needs to renew its mind. The church needs to renew its mind and stop this gentle bias towards being conformed to the pattern of the world. Because whether we like it or not, it's happening all around us. It's happening all around us. Now here's the thing. If God calls his creation to not be conformed to the pattern of the world, then let me just start by saying this. Then you can be sure that God himself will not be conformed to the pattern of the world. God himself will not be conformed to the pattern of the world. Now if I look at the world today and I look at the church today, if I'm honest, that's, a, that, that's something I'm seeing in the church space. It's almost like I'm seeing a world that has been conformed a certain way coming into the church and now the church taking the very image of God and trying to conform the image of God into the pattern of this world. But it doesn't matter whether I want to conform God into the pattern of this world. I'm very clear from what I read in the scriptures. God himself, the very essence of God, he will not conform himself to the pattern of the world. God is God. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. He will not be changed just because the world around us changes. God won't be changed just because I want him to be different. God is who God is. God is the most solid uh, uh, foundation, unshakable thing. And he won't be changed by man or our opinions. And it's, I see that right throughout the scripture. Henry Russo, he was a French painter. He said this once, and you probably all heard this. He said, God created man in his own image. And man being a gentleman returned the favour. Man being a gentleman return the favour. And, and that's what I see when I look at the church today. That's one of the fears I have is that we are creating a God to suit our very own image. We don't want to be persecuted anymore. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to be not liked. We don't want to be cancelled. So how do we not, not end up in those places? Well, let's create a God that we worship that fits in with the confirmation and narrative of the world because the more he slots into that, the safer we are. The more relevant we are. The more popular we are. We can keep our tax-free status. We can stay on television. We can have our YouTube channels. We can have our Twitter followers. See, the days of the world and the church dancing around in the gray spaces, well, not unfortunately, I believe fortunately are over. For many, many years, it was almost, if you can imagine a playground with the world over here and the church here, but the playground allowed everybody to play and we all played kind of the same. So it was all right, we got on. But then something shifted in about the last 10 years. All of a sudden, the playground doesn't belong. It's not a social space that belongs to everybody now. The world's taken over the playground. And if you want to play in the playground, then, then we've got to be okay with you. And if we're not okay with you, we'll kick you out of, the, out of the, the playground. And many people in the church are going, well, I don't want to get kicked out of the playground. So the only way I don't get kicked out of the playground is I've got to be okay and, and accepting of all some of this stuff that's going on over here. Because if I accept that, you'll accept me. But in the same time as I'm accepting all that, I'm also going to put my arm around your shoulder and look at the rest of the church and go, I'm not like them guys. I'm a Christian, but I'm not like them guys. I'm, I'm different to them. I'm different to those Christians over there. Look at me. It's a terrible state of affairs. And I want to have a little look at it. how I think, how I think we got here. Because I think there's a pattern. There's something that's happened in the Western church in particular. I'm only speaking of the Western church. We lived in India for a number of years. And let me tell you something. I didn't encounter the same stuff over there. They were very clear. Here's, here, here's who God is. Here's what the scriptures teach. There's a difference between us as Christians and you as Hindus or Muslims or secular or whatever it is. They were very clear on who they believed God was. But I come back here to the West and there's this melting pot beginning to happen. So we live in a time in human history where culture, in many cases with assistance from the church, is trying to reinterpret the word of God, rebrand the church, and redefine the very person of God. God is something other than what we've always believed for 2,000 years of orthodox Christian belief. So we've talked about renewing the mind from the perspective of our inner narrative. Now I want to move to the outer narrative. I want to take a turn away from our internal world and start looking at our external world, what we see in society around us and the line between Christianity and culture. We're going to take a few weeks to unpack this, but I just want to start with one thing that I think is foundational to the issue. Back in the 80s, or late 70s it started, we had this movement in the Western church. And, and, and by the way, let me, let, let me say this. I, everything I'm about to say with a bit of a, I, I guess, perhaps a, a negative twist has a positive to it. So I don't want anyone thinking I'm dissing it. I'm not. Matter of fact, everything I'm about to say, you're going to say, but Alan, I see that here. And you're right. You're right. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, the Western church decided that, that what we need to do is we need to come up with some way of getting people that don't want to go to church to come to church. 
And so we came up with this thing that has become known as the seeker-friendly service. Anyone ever heard that term? The seeker-friendly service, the seeker-friendly model. Now, let me just start by saying this. I think it was a br- that the heart and motivation behind why we want to do that is brilliant. And I would say that we are, to a certain degree, a seeker-friendly service. We hope that you feel comfortable to bring your non-Christian friends and family members to come and to experience God in this space. But at the same time, there are certain things that we won't negate. There are certain things that we won't compromise on. There are certain things you're never going to hear us say, and there are certain things we're never going to stop saying. But for all intents and purposes, we are somewhat a seeker-friendly church. But what happened was we began this seeker-friendly movement in the church. Now, the seeker-friendly movement was about making outsiders feel comfortable in the church, And so what did we do? We began by changing our music. First of all, we changed instruments, right? We went from the organs and that, and we started bringing in guitars. Then eventually, when people got comfortable with guitars, we brought in the devil's music, the the, the drum, right? (laughs) Apparently, the drum, remember all those, back in the 80s, the drum was from the devil and all to do with, you know, sorry, drummers. I don't believe it. It's not true. But that's, that's kind of what people thought. You can't bring beat. If you have a beat, there's something wrong with it. You know, I don't know. I reckon Israel would have pumped out a pretty decent beat at their festivals. That's just my opinion. So we changed our musical instruments and then we changed music itself. We moved away from the deep theology of the hymns and the psalms. And we started writing songs that were, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying they're bad, but I'm saying we, we went away from this rich depth of theology and we began writing songs that were more about feelings. And slowly those things became more and more popular. And not only were they about feelings, but I think they eventually became more about the music than the actual lyrical content. And then, of course, you start getting into the Christian music scene where people are now making lots of money by writing a cracking worship song. Uh, you can set yourself up. You can get a name for yourself. You can, like anything in Christianity, you can write books and become world famous by just writing about the right thing in the right way and everyone knows you and you can make a squillion bucks out of it. Again, I'm not, I'm, please hear my, those of you that hang around and rise long enough, you know my heart, amen? Give me an amen if you know my heart. Okay, thank you. I'm not dissing it. I'm not having a go at people. I'm not having a go at it. A worker is worthy of his wages, all right? But when it becomes all of a sudden about we've got to get the right riff and the right tune and the right chords, that becomes more important than the depth of the theology in what we're singing. Then worship kind of, the experience changes, becomes more about how we feel in relation to how the music makes us feel as opposed to the depth of the lyric and what it is we're actually expressing from our heart to God. So the music changed. Then we started to dumb down our preaching and teaching. Because all of a sudden, we've got to, we can't talk about the deep things of God anymore. We can't, I, don't, I can't give you meat because somebody might come in here and so I'm just going to keep giving them milk. And we're just going to uh, 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 sort of dumb it down and water it down a little bit so it's much more palatable for people. I don't want to talk about sin. I don't want to talk about heaven and hell. I don't want to talk about right and wrong. I don't want to talk about this stuff anymore. Right? I just, we, we started dumbing it down so that people would get it. And again, is it a bad thing? No. Do I preach simply? I hope I do because I don't think I'm that smart. So everything come, might come in my brain really intelligent, but it comes out my mouth very simple. That's, that's my hope. So again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but I'm saying this is what happened. And then in some cases, many churches actually removed communion from their Sunday gatherings. They took communion out. Why? Well, because if you're not a believer, seriously, if you're not a believer in this place, let me just tell you, if you think sucking juice out of a thimble and eating around that, that dry wafer is weird, you're right. You're dead right, unless you understand it from where we're sitting. And what it represents for us, the the body of Jesus broken, his blood shed for us so that our bodies will not need to be broken and our blood will not be shed. It means something to us. So so in order to to, to make it palatable, a lot of churches took communion out of their Sunday gatherings. Now during this time, in order to not offend non-believers and in order to keep them coming back and feeling comfortable, we began to place an absolute emphasis on God's love. God just loves you. So much, you are so special to him. You are so precious to God. You are the apple of his eye. If there was no one on planet earth, only you, he would die for you and all this. Now, hear my heart. I'm not saying any of that is wrong. I'm not saying any of that is wrong. But we adopted an overemphasis on telling people how wonderful and great they were in the eyes of God because that's how you get them to come back. Now, if we trusted the Holy Spirit, we don't need that, do we? We just preach the truth. We just preach the word of God and we trust the Holy Spirit to do the work in the heart of human beings. I, I can say nothing from up, from up front here and convict you. I can say nothing that will change your heart. I can say nothing that, that, nothing's going to transform you on a Sunday unless the Spirit of God himself touches your heart, takes those words and makes them real to you. Okay? But in order to make people feel comfortable, we began to overemphasize the love of God. 
And what I want to talk about this morning, I guess, just as a bit of a foundation to lead, to bounce into the next few weeks when we look at cultural things, is this idea, this concept that God is love. Because I think we so overemphasize love. And we so told people that God is love. And, and it, is, it is right, biblically. God is love. Let me, let, let, let's go and have a look right now. In 1 John 4, there's, there's, there's only actually two passages, by the way. Two passages in the New Testament that say God is love. Every, every other time it talks about love, it does talk about uh, God so loved. It talks about what God did out of a motivation of love. But these two passages clearly say that God in his very essence is love. 1 John 4 verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. In verse 16, and so we, now, we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Now, here's the reality. God is love. That is 100% true. Love is not something God just does. It's also the very essence of his being. God is love. Now, what we've gone ahead and done is we've made the essence of the gospel message the most famous and memorized Bible passage of all time, John 3.16. For God so loved the world. So when we, when we, the gospel message now is John 3.16. For God so loved the world. For God so loves you that he gave his son for you. And you know what? Again, is that true? Yes. But let, 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 let's, let's understand that passage just for, for a little bit, John 3.16. Let's understand it for a little bit in context. John, the book of John was written about 60 years after Christ's death. It was written to a group of people. It was written at a time where people were starting to say, Jesus actually wasn't the son of God. He was just a man. Right? So John writes his gospel to believers. Right? And he tells us that in, in the back end, John 21, 22. One of those, he says very clearly, this is why I wrote this. I wrote this so that you would basically have confidence in what you've always believed, that, that Jesus actually is the son of God. The book of John revolves around seven miracles. Things that are so amazing that, that the readers are going, oh, no, look, he must have been God. He did that. He had to be God. He did that. He had to be God. He did that. John 14, Jesus makes a statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life, linking himself to the Old, Old Testament I am statements that Yahweh made about who he was God. So, so John's writing for a reason. So John's saying, John 3.16, the audience that are hearing that, that are reading that, they're not reading that going, oh, I better get my life, get saved. They're reading it going, okay, so this salvation I have, I can, it's firm, it's solid, I believe it. Jesus really was. John 3.16, the emphasis of the passage is not for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The emphasis from the reader's perspective was not the world, it was Jesus. I'm writing to you about Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So whoever believes in him. The the focal point was not the love that God has for us, although it expresses that. The focal point of John 3.16 was actually Jesus and his divinity. Now, you go to the book of Acts. What's the gospel message they preach there? Acts chapter 2, the first message ever preached on the day of Pentecost. He stands up and he says these things. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Have a change of mind that's going to lead to a change of action. That's what repentance is. Because the way you're thinking and the way you're living right now ain't right. So you've got to change your mind. And you've got to change your thinking and change your life. And what are you believing in? You're believing that Jesus was actually the Son of God. He stands up to this crowd and he says to them, this Jesus who you crucified, who you killed, he's talking to the very ones that played some role in the crucifixion of Christ. They did not believe that he was the Son of God. That's why they did what they did. He stands up and goes, you know, you were wrong. Repent and believe. You didn't think he was. He really is. Change your thinking, change your life and start following the very one that you you yelled out, crucify, crucify to. So the gospel message in the New Testament is, is repent and believe, right? But we've moved away from repent and believe to just God loves everybody and everything. And we fast forward to 2024 and we look at the world we're in now and we go, kind of open slather now, isn't it? You can do anything, be anything, have anything. And God just loves everything. It's all good. So here's the problem. We spend so much time telling the world that God is love, but we never defined what love is by God's terms. And we said, God is love, God is love, God is love, God is love, loud and clear and long enough that eventually the world went, we get it, God is love, okay. Then let us tell you what love looks like. And the church went, oh, I didn't know that. All this time we've been so hateful and so hurtful. Oh, we better change our ways. Now, has the church been hateful? Yes. And if you can stick with me, we're going to cover some of this stuff in the coming weeks. I don't want you checking out. Has the church been hurtful? Yes. 
And we're going to look at some of this stuff as the weeks go on. But I just want to start right now by, 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 by making this statement that if God is love, then God alone has the right to clarify what love looks like. God himself is the only one that has the right to define what love looks like. Not me, not you, and not the world. Right? Does that make sense? God is love. God is love. So in other words, God who is love has allowed man. This is, what, this, is what, this is where we're sitting right now. This is what it looks like. God who is love has allowed man to determine and define what love actually looks like. And we're getting ourselves into all sorts of trouble. And this has led to some wrong ideas about love that lead to some wrong ideas about God. I just want to throw at you four really quickly uh, wrong ideas that, that, that the culture has given to love that many in the church have bought into. Uh, reason, thing number one, love means making you happy. Love means making you happy. You got that on the slide there? Love means making you happy. Therefore, if that's what love is, if love means making you happy, then therefore God is committed to and okay with anything that makes you happy. Can you, can you see how a wrong concept of love and then taking that wrong concept of love and overlying that to God and saying, well, that's what God is, can lead us into all kinds of error and down all kinds of slippery slopes. In 1996, Sheryl Crow, anyone Sheryl Crow? Fanny, I remember yet? Sheryl Crow wrote the song. You know what it was? If it makes you happy, it, it can't be that bad. I had a son, I can't remember if it was Jonathan or Jordan, one of them loved to stick blue tack up his nose and he'd shove it up and shove it up and shove it up. Hey, guess what? It made him happy. But it wasn't real good for him, you know? One breathed back in and down there. So I remember a couple of times we rushed him to the hospital. You might have stuck a marble up your nose once, didn't you? Was it Chloe stuck a marble? Somebody. Anyway, here's the point. They were sticking things up their nose. It made them happy. They thought it was great. But was it good? No. Just because something makes you happy doesn't mean it's good for you. Amen? But hey, but if it makes you happy, then, then God's committed to your happiness, so he must be okay with it. Therefore, you can do whatever you want. Psalm 1 verse 1 to 2 says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk. And by the way, that Hebrew word blessed, let me, the Hebrew word blessed can also be translated happy. It's the same, you can use that word, it can be translated happy. So here's what Psalm, the psalmist is saying, here's what David's saying. Let's say, replace it with the word happy. Happy is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. In other words, there are mockers, there are sinners and there's a wrong way. And you're happy when you avoid it. Part of human happiness is to avoid that. But those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditate on his word, on his Lord day and night. Happiness comes from doing the right things and staying away from the wrong things. So God is okay with the right things because he's a father and desires to see his children happy. But he's not okay with the wrong things. He wants to keep you away from them. Even, even the concept of saying some things are right and some things are wrong weeks people out these days because God is love. God is love. The second thing, that, that misconception of love that we get when we allow the world to define what love is, is that love doesn't restrict a person's freedoms. Now, if love doesn't restrict a person's freedoms, then God will never tell you anything's off limits because that would be restricting your freedom. Right? It's a slippery slope. So God does not restrict your freedoms. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. Jesus said this. This came from the mouth of Jesus. Now, I could, I could take a whole bunch of passages from a whole bunch of other people, but, but I really love when Jesus speaks because I think everything else in the New Testament should be filtered through the words and teachings of Jesus himself, not the other way around. Okay? Jesus first. Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. That sounds like he's saying when you come to faith, if you want to live the blessed life, there's a certain restriction to it. You can't just run around doing whatever you want. There's a boundary, there are railway tracks, there are things outside of it that are not good for you, they're not good for society, they're not good for the community, they're not good for your children, they're not good for your marriage, they're not good for your finances, they're not good for your mental health. Stay within the tracks, this is really good, you'll be happy in there, but you get outside of that, it's not so great. It's not so great. In John 8, uh, verse 11, when Jesus meets the woman that's caught in adultery, and, and he says, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And everybody drops their stones and disappears. 
And Jesus is left standing there with this woman who was caught in adultery. There was also a man there. We all know that because adultery takes two. We don't know where the man is, but there's the woman. And then Jesus says, where are your accusers? And she says, they're all gone. And Jesus says this, neither do I condemn you. But he doesn't leave it at that. He says, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. What you did was wrong. There's nothing wrong with saying wrong is wrong. He said, it's wrong what you did. And look where it got you. My, I'm telling you, go and stop doing it. Go and stop living that way. There's nothing wrong with calling wrong, wrong. But there's something wrong with calling wrong, right. Amen? Amen. There's something wrong with calling wrong right. The third slippery slope, when we start letting the world define love instead of God himself defining love, is this. Love makes room for all truths. Now, if love makes room for all truths, then God has no absolutes anymore and he embraces everyone's perspective and opinion on anything. It's amazing how many guys on YouTube have zero theological training, but they're telling the next generation about God. But they don't know nothing. They've had a bad experience in church and now they're theologizing people out of faith. It's amazing. My, con- <coughs> excuse me, my concern when I look at the, the younger generation is I ask myself this question, when they're 18, what's, what's a Sunday gathering going to look like? What are they going to hear preached from the front by the time they're 18? What are we going to cherry pick out of this book that we don't, no longer believe in and don't want to tell them anymore? because we don't want to offend or hurt or disappoint. Because we want to be inclusive and not exclusive. What's, what's, what's a church gathering going to be like for them? What's going to be the most popular book being sold at Kuron? There are guys already in, 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 if you follow Christian music, there are songs in the Christian music industry sitting in the top 10 in the Christian charts that are sung by people that don't even follow Jesus. By, by, by people who are, and I don't want to offend anybody, and if you hang with me for a few weeks, we're gonna, I'm going to explain some stuff here. You may get offended, that's okay, I, I don't mean to offend you though. But when you've, you, when you've got drag queens mocking God, singing about God, and charting in the Christian charts, something is wrong. Something is wrong, people. John 14, 6, Jesus makes the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He doesn't say, I'm one of the truths, I'm one of the ways, and I'm one of the lives. In saying that statement to a Jewish audience, I am, they knew what he was saying. He was linking himself as being Jehovah himself. Go back to the Old Testament when God said, I am that I am. Jesus knew what he was saying when he said that, and they knew what they were hearing. There was no, there was no room for error. Back in the Old Testament, God said, it's, I've got a way, and this is how it is. And you walk in it, and you'll be blessed, and you don't, you won't. And when Jesus said that, they knew what Jesus was saying. He was linking himself to that. I am the way. There's only one way. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. There's not another way, people. Repentance and faith is the way to be reunited with God, reconnected with God. And the fourth slippery slope when it comes to love and allowing the world to define love is that love then removes the need for consequence. Therefore, there's no need for any type of divine discipline. In other words, God can't be mad at you. God can't allow anything to happen. God, let's, let's get rid of, of, of eternal punishment. or let's, Whatever your doctrine is or belief of hell, the fact that there's a separation from God, there are people that believe that there will be no separation from God. We're all going to be there because it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. See, love says yes to everything. And saying no to anything is considered an act of hate. That's what the world's telling us. Love says yes to everything. If you say no to anything, you're, you're hateful. And a lot of Christians, we're good people. We don't want to be seen as being hateful, do we? So instead of standing on the word of God and going, I'm not being hateful, I'm just telling you this is love as God defines it, and God is love. Yeah. Don't blame me, get <laughs> mad at God. Yep. Instead, many of us are backing up, going, that, that makes sense because I don't want to be hateful. I don't want to be hurtful. Hey, I don't want to be hateful, and I don't want to be hurtful. But I don't have the right to change the word of God. I don't have a right to come up with another image of who God is or to take his teachings or to twist them so they make me feel comfortable and more popular and I get more hits on YouTube. <laughs> you know? I don't have that right. John 5, 14. 
There's a guy at the, 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 the pool of Bethesda. We all know the story. And Jesus comes by him and, and, and Jesus says, do you want to be made well? And the guy's like, well, how can I? No one will pick me up and put me in, in the pool. He'd obviously done something that was probably a fair bit reprehensible and nobody wanted to go near him and help him. We know that because later on, when Jesus does actually heal him, Jesus uh, uh, finds him and Jesus says this to him in John 5.14. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. So whatever situation he found himself in, Jesus says part of that is a consequence of the way you've been living, dude. Stop living like that. Because there are consequences. Right, wrong, good, bad. There are consequences. Matthew 25, verse 41 to 43. Jesus himself, then he will say to those on his left, he's got the sheep and the goats and he separates them. And he says to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me in. You needed clothes, you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. Depart from me, you are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That doesn't sound good, I don't like it. But Jesus said it. Jesus said it, he gives this illustration. That to me looks like a consequence for something. One consequence over here, they call themselves goats. Another consequence over here for sheep, right? And guess what? It was based on the way they lived, the choices they made, the things they did according to what I'm reading here or didn't do. There's a consequence. See, if God is love, then it's his right and his right only to define what love looks like. Transition from the old covenant to the new covenant was not a transition from an old God to a new one. God in, the ve- God in the very essence of his being is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same God. In other words, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, it wasn't done just as an act of love, it was done by love itself. Love itself destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. When the world was flooded, that was done by love itself. The drowning of Pharaoh and his armies was done by love itself. A fish swallowing Jonah and spewing him out on the beach was done by love itself. Jesus upturning the tables in the temple was done by love itself. John the Baptist being beheaded instead of being saved from his prison cell, that was allowed and done by love itself. Jesus walking away from a crowd who came to be healed and delivered in Mark chapter 1 when revival broke out. People turned up the next morning wanting him to touch him, and he said, no, I'm going to another village, and he left those people there. That was done by love itself. The death of Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament for lying to the Holy Spirit was done by love itself. Allowing Stephen, a man of God, to be stoned to death for preaching the gospel was done by love itself. Now let me tell you something. I know people out there in the world who are taking all those same examples and going, this proves God's not loving. Based on what? Based on their worldly definition of what love looks like. We don't know what love looks like. As terrible as these all appear from our human standpoint of love, these were all either directly performed or allowed by love itself. Isaiah 55, 7 to 9, Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he'll have mercy on them. And to our God for he'll freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, declares the Lord. And my ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. People, that is the truth. God doesn't say my ways are different to your ways and my thoughts are different to yours. That would put us all on the same level. He says, no, it's not. Mine are higher. In other words, mine are right up there. Your thoughts can only go to here and there's a big gap and you just got to trust by faith because my thoughts are up here and my ways are up here and you can't reach my thoughts and you can't reach my ways. But what are you going to believe? Continue to be conformed to the pattern of the world or are you going to trust me? It's a choice. And we're all confronted with it. What are we going to do with that? How many of you have ever done something that others didn't fully understand or even agree with simply because you had knowledge they were not aware of? Who's ever done something? And other people might not have understood it at the time, but you knew something. How many parents have done something and the kids got disappointed or angry or frustrated, but it's only because they didn't know what you knew? I didn't say you couldn't go to that party because I didn't want you to have fun. I knew who was going to be at that party. I knew what was going to happen at that party. That's why I said, I don't want you to go to the party. That's why I didn't let you go. I I told you, you had to do that assignment and complete it and get it in because I know what's going to happen if you do. If you do, you might get a good mark. I know what's going to happen if you don't. You might not make it into university. So every time we said, get in your room and study, it was an act of love. (laughs) It was an act of love. And look, now you're at university. Awesome. Loving it. Get the muse has to come back. Come back up. Romans 12, verse 9. Paul, 
gives us what I think is a really good definition of love as we begin this series and we start to look at renewing the mind in terms of what we believe and what's floating out there in culture. Romans 12 verse 9. Love must be sincere. What does sincere love look like? Well, Paul's very smart. He says, now I'm going to tell you what sincere love looks like. Here's what it looks like. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. You want a good definition of love in the year 2024? Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Love separates good from evil. Therefore, calling good good and evil evil is not an act of hate. It's an act of love. It's an act of love. And we are constantly as a church being told that it's an act of hate. And because we don't want to be haters, our little hearts melt and we give in a little bit here and we give in a little bit there and we allow the line to get pushed back and pushed back and pushed back and pushed back until eventually people look at the church and go, we actually don't even know what you stand for anymore. We actually don't know what you believe anymore. Even the world is smart enough to go, but you're saying this, but, but even I know your Bible says this. Like, what's, yeah. is this, is, are you one of these people or not? Love separates good from evil. Calling good, good, and evil, evil is not an act of hate, it's an act of love. I want to finish with a couple of testimonies, stories of people that I've listened to and read. Here's why. Here's why, people, we need to. Be clear on what the Word of God teaches. Here's why we cannot afford to be conformed to the pattern of the world. Here's why you and I need to be transformed by renewing our mind with the Word of God. Here's a comment I found online from a person who followed Jesus and then deconstructed their faith. They said this, I no longer believe in hell. I no longer believe that God requires blind faith or belief. In fact, I don't believe God requires anything of us at all. I think if God cares, God wants us to just simply live. To enjoy life and do whatever we choose to do. I don't think there are any requirements. Now, obviously, God doesn't want us to hurt other people. Now, you've just contradicted yourself there straight away. Like, on the one hand, you're saying it doesn't really matter, but then we'll come back to this. Well, where does that come from? The law of God's written on the heart of man, people. He said, but I kind of feel like when I die, God will say to me, did you have fun? I'll say yes, and God will say, great, come on in. I think we worry too much and we live in fear, and that should not be. As a result of my new perspective, so this was not his perspective before, this is my new perspective, I no longer live in fear. In fact, I think I have finally found the peace that passes all understanding. Ironically to me, this is the biggest validation of where I am. How I feel about life seems to be more in alignment with God is love. What's he saying? God is love. Therefore, the boundaries are gone, the shackles are gone. Whatever you do, if it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. He says, how I feel about life seems to be more in alignment with God is love. I think Christianity has so much wrong. There's another girl online too, and she's doing a similar thing. She's got a YouTube channel now, was a Christian, was a believer, and now uh, instead of just quietly going, look, I, I don't have to share the Christian faith anymore, I'll just go off into the background. Now what do they do? All these people seem to want to gather a big following and try to preach to a whole world and a whole generation and tell them why they deconstructed in the hope that they can lead you down the same path. I pray for these people. You know why? Because Jesus said, it's better for you to have an anchor tied around your neck and be thrown into the deepest ocean than to cause one of my little ones to stumble. And the internet is full of people trying to talk our kids and our grandkids and our brothers and our sisters and our family members and our friends out of faith with no theological training whatsoever. They're trying to teach a bunch of people that have no theological understanding and they just listen to it going, oh, that sounds good, that must be right. And it makes our job so much harder then because now we're trying to re, re-undo and we're trying to re-educate and so on the people around us. But it makes it even harder when they look and go, well, hang on a second, I know what, you churches are all into this stuff too. What's the difference? Here's what she said. She said, the catalyst for my deconstruction was examining the biblical God and comparing him to the God that I believed in. There's your problem right there. There's the biblical God and there's simply the one you choose to believe in. And therein lies the problem today. We have the biblical God, but then we have the God we want to believe in. And why do we want to believe in him? Well, it takes a bit of pressure off, doesn't it? More people like us. We won't get cancelled. Maybe we can grow our church bigger if we remove the shackles. Maybe I won't lose my job. Maybe I won't have to take a stand. Maybe people won't notice. Uh, I won't stand out. Maybe I won't have to have those conversations. Whatever the reason is. Jesus was very strategic 2,000 years ago. He said to his disciples, he said this, if they persecute me, they'll persecute you. He said, if they don't like me, they're not going to like you. He made it very clear. He tried to pre-warn us. 
But now we're trying to back out of that and go, no, 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 we, well, I, really reckon, I really reckon we can make Christianity sexy again. I reckon we can just get rid of a whole bunch of things out of it. And before you know it, those little kids are coming to church on Sunday, instead of hearing about the biblical God, they're hearing about a God that we simply believe in. That's what frightens me. When they come, are they going to hear about the biblical God or just simply the one the preacher chooses to believe in? If your God is not God as revealed through the Bible, then he's nothing more than something you believe in. And if the church does not re-embrace the biblical God, then eventually the next generation will be walking into the doors of a church to hear about nothing more than something we believe in. I'll finish with this. There's a girl online. I want to pray for some people in a second. There's a girl online, and she was on um, uh, some platform where you can go on and sell stuff of yourself and people subscribe and all this sort of stuff. We all, we all know the stuff. We, it's out there. And she had a recent conversion to Christianity in the last couple of weeks. Praise God. Praise God. And from, it sounds very genuine. And she was being interviewed. And in this interview, she made this uh, statement. She shared a story and she said it was, there was a real moment for her when her parents, and to quote her, drew a line in the sand. They basically said to her, this is unacceptable. That's wrong. She came from a Christian family. And her parents said, that's not right. What you are doing is not right. The path you're going down is not right. She said that it was a moment, her words, this was a real moment when her parents drew a line in the sand. She also went on and said, it's hurtful to think that your parents actually have a line drawn in the sand in terms of what they will and won't accept and will they actually love you past a certain point. Even though it was that line in the sand that got her thinking about her life and ended up leading her back to faith and back towards Jesus. People, it's okay to speak up about some of this stuff. It's okay to draw a bit of a line in the sand. In fact, I think it's right that we do it. I, I, I do not want to offend or judge anybody here. I, I really don't. But when I go on Facebook and I see a rainbow as your profile picture, it says something. Might not, might not be what you want to say. But in the world we live in, it says something, doesn't it? Again, stick with me. I want to, I'm going to talk about all this stuff as the weeks go on. Because we don't want to draw a line in the sand. We just want to let everybody know we love them. And we do. We want everybody to know that they're special and they are. We want everyone to know that God loves them and he does. But we have to stop watering down every other attribute of God and every other aspect of God and every other part of God just to appease what men want to hear these days just to hear what men want to hear. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you being transformed by the word of God? Or maybe today while I'm talking, you've realized that you're, there's areas where you're being conformed to the pattern of this world. For good reasons. I just don't want to be a hater. I don't want to be considered a bigot. I don't want to be whatever. Pick your word these days. Pretty much every word means something. Are you being transformed by the word of God? Or are you being conformed slowly to the pattern of this world? Whatever you're following, you're being conformed or transformed into. Are you following the patterns of this world or the Word of God? Because whatever you're following is leading you. And whatever's leading you is taking you somewhere. Just like the stories of those three individuals I just read out. You might think that would never be me. Well, keep going. Keep going. See where you land. It's one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time away from God. Or one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time with Him and towards Him. See, the gospel calls us to two things. It calls us to costly self-denial. That means no to sin. There is such a thing as sin. There's right and there's wrong. The gospel calls us to costly self-denial, saying no to sin. Maybe there are some people here today and maybe in your heart you're going, you know what, I kind of feel like I've bought into some of that stuff and Maybe my, in my heart, I've kind of starting to slide down that path of God is love and love is love and it's all, all okay. And Maybe that's you. If that's you this morning, and I pray the Holy Spirit would just convict your heart as a loving father and pull you back. Pull you back. It's never too late. It's never too late. You can sit here this morning and just say, Lord, that's me. Lord, that's me. How about we close our eyes for a second? I'm going to go after a second group of people in a second too, but I want every eye closed, every head bowed. I don't want anyone looking up, please. Just respect everyone's privacy here. 
If that's you this morning, you're here and you just know, you're not a bad person, you haven't walked away from God, none of that, but you just know that you've slowly allowed culture to chip away to the point where you're going, yeah, you know what, maybe I'm sliding the wrong way a little bit here. If that's you, I just want you to do me a favour. Just, just as a sign before you and God, would you just throw your hand in the air and bring it straight back down. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. God gives grace upon grace to the humble. He gives grace upon grace to the humble people. That is awesome. That is awesome. Where you are right now, just for 30 seconds, why don't you just have a chat to God? Just repent and believe. Change your mind. Just tell God, God, going forward, I'm going to agree with you, Lord. It may cost me. It may cost me, Lord, but it's worth it. It's worth it. To be a man or woman of God, to stand for truth in an age where truth is being so diluted, it's worth it, people. And Lord, I pray for those people right now, God. I pray for those people. Father, thank you for their humility. Thank you, Lord, right now as as they have humbled themselves, your grace is running to them. You give grace to the humble, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now from this day on, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you lead them down the right path? Would Would you show them when those thoughts pop up, when those things are there, God, would you bring them back on the right path, Lord? You love them. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. I want to ask about a second group of people here. The gospel calls us to a costly self-denial, but it also calls us to a Christ-like love. That means embracing people who are not like you. Not diminishing their value because they think different to you. Not feeling like the, the... Not getting so lost in trying to win the doctrinal argument that we lose sight of the person made in the image of God. Remember this, the ones who were not like Jesus, the ones who were least like Jesus, like Jesus. Now we, the ones who were the least like Jesus, they actually like Jesus. I think the people who are least like Jesus today, I wonder whether we would like them back. And there's a lot of people out there. And if you're here this morning, every eye closed, head down, it's between you and God. If you're here this morning and you know that maybe you go, you've gone so hard after the issues and the stuff that's going on, and again, your heart is good, but you've lost a little bit of the sight of the fact that these people are created by God and loved by God. And the issue is winning the arguments become more important than winning the person. If that's you, again, I'm just going to ask you very quietly, very quickly, just throw your hand in the air. It's just an act between you and God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Okay, why don't we all just stand? Let's all stand this morning. Hey, we're going to keep going down this path for a number of weeks now. We're going to tackle a few things and look at a few things. Um, we're, going to, we're going to finish with the worship song. Let's put Jesus back in his rightful place. Amen.